Good afternoon. My name is Allison Reiser. I'm excited to moderate this panel today focused on socioeconomic need in the Medicare population um, and emerging innovations to address that need. I am joined today by a fantastic group of panelists with a depth of expertise working with Medicare beneficiaries. I'll introduce our panelists in just a moment, but first, some panel logistics. I'm going to kick off the panel today with about a five to 10 minute brief overview of social need in the Medicare population, along with some background on policy opportunities that are starting to emerge to address social need. We will then have a live discussion with the panelists for about 40 minutes or so, and then we will open it up for questions from the audience for the last 15 minutes. I will give you all as an audience a heads up when we are about to open up for Q&A, so keep those questions in mind and um, we're looking forward to hearing them. So with that, who do we have with us today? Um, first, we have Brandon Sawalich. Brandon is president and CEO of Starkey, the only US-based major manufacturer of hearing aids. Under Brandon's leadership, Starkey has incorporated numerous innovative technologies into their hearing aids leading to what are now multi-use telehealth devices. Brandon also serves as chairman of the Hearing Industries Association, working with government leaders to support efforts to increase the accessibility and affordability of hearing aids. And just this year, Brandon joined Medical Alley's board of directors. Our next panelist is Lucy Talheimer. She's currently the chief strategy and impact officer with Meals on Wheels America. And as part of that role, Lucy oversees the organizational healthcare integration strategy. Prior to joining Meals on Wheels America, Lucy spent her career focused on the needs of older adults, particularly in the areas of health and long-term care. In addition, she spent many years at AARP where among her various roles, Lucy led enterprise strategy and planning. Our next panelist is Dr. Nareda Correa. Nareda is the chair of the board of directors of the National Hispanic Medical Association. She is a women's health physician and is active in mentoring and promoting cultural sensitivity. Dr. Correa was the first Hispanic woman to be named chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Lincoln Medical and Mental Health Center. She also was a member of the Women's Infants and Children's National Advisory Committee and the Women's Health Steering Committee. And then finally, we have Sandy Markwood. Sandy has served as the CEO of N4A, the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging for more than 20 years. She is a tireless advocate on the value of area agencies on aging and their aging network partners in advancing health and independence of older adults and their caregivers. Under Sandy's leadership, N4A has enhanced the business capacity of its members and their providers to partner with Medicaid managed care plans and Medicare Advantage organizations to address critical social determinants of health. And again, I am Allison Reiser. I'm a principal with ATI Advisory, and I have the good fortune of moderating this panel today. Um, so with that, let's, let's talk a little bit about the background. There is a growing focus right now on moving upstream in healthcare, uh, recognition of the impact of social circumstances on one's well-being. Um, if you haven't already, I would highly recommend taking a look at the report that is shown on the top left of this slide. This is an analysis that ATI Advisory worked on for BMA, and BMA published this just last month. Um, in summary, what we found is that social need is high in the Medicare population, um, but in particular, beneficiaries enrolled in Medicare Advantage are often more likely than beneficiaries in traditional Medicare fee-for-service to have negative social risk factors. And we found this even when we accounted for income level. There are numerous statistics on this slide. Um, just a few to talk about. Roughly 20% of Medicare beneficiaries are food insecure. In other words, they don't have a reliable source of healthy food. About 12% speak a language other than English um, in the home. About a third most likely do not have internet in the home. And a statistic I don't have on here because it wasn't a focus of this particular study, but it is a really important point to frame out some of our discussion on this panel today is hearing loss, which can lead to social isolation in the Medicare population, which in itself also is a really um, impactful, um, uh, has an impactful effect on health outcomes in the, the Medicare population. And approximately 35 to 45% of the Medicare population has hearing loss or reports some difficulty with hearing. The good news though, is that in the past two to three years, a number of policy changes have emerged to allow Medicare Advantage plans to begin to address these non-medical needs through the provision of supplemental benefits. 
In 2019, CMS expanded the definition of primarily health-related in a way that effectively allows Medicare plans to now provide LTSS type services, things like adult day services and caregiver supports, in-home supports. Um, in 2020, Congress took it a step further. In 2020, Congress began allowing Medicare Advantage plans to address social need in a very targeted manner with benefits like healthy food and housing supports. Um, these are known as SSBCI. These are not your sort of post-discharge benefits. These really are agnostic of a medical event. And these taken together have been a significant turning point in Medicare policy. Um, Medicare historically has been a very acute care medical program. And suddenly with 2019, plans are able to start to address these non-medical needs as well. Um, however, it is important to level set on what these benefits are and what these benefits are not. So first, CMS and Congress are not giving Medicare Advantage plans additional dollars. These are the same dollars that plans typically spend on more traditional supplemental benefits like dental and vision and hearing and over-the-counter cards. But what CMS and Congress have done is to allow Medicare Advantage plans more flexibility in how they use those existing dollars. So again, not new funding, but it absolutely is an opportunity to start to incrementally test these non-medical approaches. Uh, ATI Advisory does a lot of work analyzing these benefit offerings, geographic trends, plan trends, benefit specific trends. What you see in this map is the current approved landscape of non-medical benefits. So this is 2020, what is approved um, today. And there are nearly 2,000 counties across the nation with at least one of these non-medical benefits offered by a Medicare Advantage plan. And 2021 is shaping up to be even better. So what you can see on this slide, um, CMS has just started to release some data on the 2021 landscape. And across the board, Medicare Advantage plans are increasingly deploying these expanded supplemental benefit authorities. So the, the two bars on the left side are the expanded primarily health related. Those are those long term services and supports type benefits. And then the two bars on the right, the SSBCIs, those are the social service type benefits. So what you can see is really substantial year over year growth in the number of plans who are offering these benefits. And we are really excited about that. Um, and with that, we are done with our overview, and we are going to uh, actually open it up for discussion to the panel. Um, and the first question uh, that we have today is actually, Lucy, for you, if you can start for us. And it's kind of broad, if you can talk a little bit about generally how these new non-medical benefits as a provider, how are they impacting your ability to serve Medicare beneficiaries? How are they helping or not helping to advance your mission? Can you just level set a little bit on how you're experiencing these new benefits? Sure, so thanks, Allison. Um, and thanks, it's great to be here this afternoon. So most of you probably know that Meals on Wheels programs across the country have been in the social determinants business for decades. And we refer to them as the more than a meal service model. And, and because of the breadth of services they provide, we think that they're ideally suited to be those non-medical partners, if you will, um, because they, um, every day, in addition to the nutrition services, they're doing in-home assessments, they're doing daily socialization, they're doing wellness checks, they're monitoring needs as they change over time and connecting people to services. So they're very well suited for this. So, you know, we were very excited to see some of these changes because Meals on Wheels programs, traditional, you know, 501c3 nonprofits, you know, their biggest limitation is resources um, and the ability to really extend their reach and impact to as many people that could benefit from the service. So we were very excited um, that about the opportunity that the new guidance um, provided for programs. Um, and we were, you know, we were active in, in helping to make that happen. We like to feel like we help contribute to that. Um, but so we're very pleased with that. So then, you know, so in, in, in essence, at the national level, we were really pleased, um, but there have been some limiting factors. Um, and the reality is, while that opportunity is there, we haven't felt it directly yet. Um, 
what we see largely mostly is still um, the post-discharge limited benefits. Um, to your point, there are no additional funds that are available to MA plans and so they are forced to make choices between things like dental, vision, hearing, and food, which is not a choice that you really hope any plan has to make, <laughs> um, but that's the, the reality. But I also think that um, while there is emphasis within the guidance to encourage relationships with community-based organizations, that's unfamiliar to Medicare Advantage plans. They don't really know that world. Um, they are not, they don't really understand how they work as businesses. The cost structure is different. Um, the availability of data that would make them feel more secure that the investment is worthwhile um, for them um, is not robust enough yet in terms of what they need to make those kinds of decisions. So we're quite frankly, we're not yet feeling the benefit at, at scale. Um, from these changes, um, but we're optimistic and hopeful and we'll continue to have conversation with plans and hope for the future on that. So you touch on a, I think a really important point that um, you know, I'd love if all of the panelists could think a little bit about is these, these new benefits mean uh, a new sort of framework for Medicare Advantage plans to work with a new type of provider. So as you're thinking through like what are maybe some of the opportunities to improve that, um, you know, I, I welcome those thoughts. And it looks like Dr. Correa, you've got a, a reaction. To Just, uh, um, I'm very, very happy to be here and proud to participate in this panel. I would like to add that these social determinants and the things that we are now looking at have been long lost in Medicare and are newly found. And I think that it's really, really important to our communities to be able to have these services when they're outside of the hospital and in their home environments. And specifically, when I was in the 1990s, we were actively activating for language services and interpreter services. And I'm kind of happy to see that, that many of the services now are provided or try to be provided in the, in the language that the person is, is having. The thing that staggered me from your slides was the huge absence of these services in the center of this country so that it looked like there were no social uh, benefits for those participants. And I see that throughout the United States that everybody has access to this because it's very important. So, so Brandon, I guess tying together kind of that, that opening question of like, how are these benefits impacting your ability to serve um, beneficiaries as well as what Nareda was just getting at with starting to get at like language barriers or communication barriers. Can you talk about it from your perspective as a hearing provider? Absolutely. And uh, I'm very honored and uh, appreciate being here today because, you know, hearing loss and, and really you look at hearing loss and then hearing aids. And when people think of hearing aids, there's the stigma that's associated with it. But it's really a, a stigma of, of 20 or 30 years ago, because, you know, what we can do now with technology uh, on any front with uh, medicine uh, is beyond what's, uh, you know, the media might report or we might have in our, our mind. And hearing loss is a, uh, is, a, is a health issue. And, you know, we look at it as, you know, it is essential. And we saw this also going through COVID, but knowing the psychological, um, uh, you know, uh, effect of hearing loss for people not even, you know, 60 or 65 uh, and older. Uh, we know that hearing loss is correlated with depression and heart disease and, and being able to connect with people because, you know, if you can't hear or you have that, you know, silent condition, no pun intended, you're removed from society. You start drawing within and you can't get the social engagement, the activity. Uh, a lot of other things come with uh, uh, hearing loss from your balance uh, to being able just to hear the, the simplest things that we might take for granted uh, for uh, walking and hearing your feet shuffle on the carpet and you know that you're balanced. And so, you know, hearing loss is, uh, you know, there's over 40 million, um, 50 million, if you go to uh, 65 and, uh, and older uh, in the US with hearing loss. We have an active aging uh, population. 83% of the uh, uh, of uh, Medicare Advantage plans have some type of hearing benefit. The you know I get asked a lot when I talk with members of, of Congress or or patients or people looking for for hearing help if Medicare covers uh, hearing aids and hearing devices. And at this time it doesn't. But this is why I wanted to be part of this because we're bringing the the conversation uh, to the forefront 
and also uh, you know, putting the overall hearing healthcare system, because you're not just buying a device, it's the overall care uh, of, of that device with the hearing loss, because a hearing loss is like a thumbprint. It's, it, everybody is, everybody's hearing loss and ear is unique, and it's not just a grab and go. So we're bringing this discussion to the forefront and, and on the radar uh, because you know it's an active aging population and more and more people need what we're providing. Thank you for that. And, and Sandy, do you want to respond as well? Generally, you know, how are these new non-medical opportunities um, impacting, uh, you know, area agencies on aging and their ability to better meet the needs of beneficiaries? Do you have reactions to them generally? Sure, Allison. And again, thank you for having me on the panel. And what a great um, panel to be on. Uh, it, amazing people um, that I get to to be joined with. From the area agencies on aging perspective, and again, you know, the area agencies on aging have been uh, were created in 1973 as part of the Older Americans Act, um, and the Older Americans Act is a foundation for area agencies. But now, three quarters of area agencies um, are have a, has their funding base Medicaid, um, HCBS, and then also three quarters of area agencies on aging serve people under the age of 60 who have chronic illnesses or functional disabilities. So our, our breadth has increased over time, but the mission of keeping people at home and in the community and aging well there has not changed at all. And in saying that, our, the basis of what area agencies have, have done since their inception has been to really support the social determinants of health. So the fact that now in the healthcare community that there is that growing realization of how important the social determinants are to the health and well-being of Medicare beneficiaries is, is very exciting. Um, still growing and evolving, but exciting. And in saying that from our perspective, in addition to working with area agencies on aging through the Aging and Disability Business Institute that N4A operates, um, which is broader, it's, it's all aging and disability community-based organizations. What we have seen is an intense amount of interest on the part of AAAs and other aging and disability CBOs to really do this level of contracting and engagement around the social determinants of health. N4A together with the National Council on Aging has run two learning collaboratives where we had people waiting in line to be able to participate in those to look at ways that they could operate and contract with MA plans. And in addition to that, in the surveys that we've done, what we found out is in the past two years, there's been a, a, a doubling of an, a number of area agencies on aging that are contracting with MA plans um, from 10% to 20%. So not big figures yet, but they're growing. And what we also found in that survey is that over 40% of AAAs are contracting with healthcare in general, which really gives a sense of the opportunity for growth in contracting with Medicare Advantage plans. The types of services that community-based organizations are contracting for with MA plans are evidence-based programming looking at care transitions and care coordination, and also nutrition and, and, and you know, recognizing um, that that's also a realm that Meals on Wheels America is in. For AAAs, it's primarily nutrition, um, but there's opportunity here for growth. And that what we found in addition to, is that the MA opportunity and other healthcare opportunities are creating opportunities for community-based organization, AAAs and others to come together and network to be able to form strong systems to be able to contract with healthcare. So what we see is real interest and real opportunity on the part of AAAs and other community-based organizations to really contract with Medicare Advantage and other healthcare programs. So I, I want to drill a little bit deeper on um, on the CBO and Medicare Advantage phenomenon, and this is something that you know we we've he heard a lot in our work as well. Is that there are some CBOs who can connect with some MAs and they do it really well, and then there are other CBOs and other MA plans that really struggle. And Sandy, I'm going to continue with you, and then and then mm -hmm. interested in other panelists' reactions. Can you talk a little bit about like, what is it that makes certain CBOs, or in your case, AAAs, like? what empowers them to 
be a better partner to MA plans and vice versa? What creates MA plans that are better partners to AAAs? Well, I think what we have seen is that, um, you know, one is what we work with our AAAs and other community-based organizations is to make sure that they have the capacity, that they know what programs they're offering. They have the capacity to be able to deliver the outcomes that are necessary. And in, say, in saying that, that is why we're seeing the growth in networks where AAAs and other community-based organizations can come together and they're stronger together in their outreach. Um, so it's being able to negotiate a contract, to be able to price adequately, to be able to, um, to, be able to have that quality and consistent reach. Um, and data is really, really critical in that. You know, on the other side of the equation, you know, one of the some of the challenges that we're seeing is contracting and recognizing that they may start up a, a conversation with one um, one healthcare payer and then whoever they're whoever they're talking to leaves and then they're starting all over again. And then the difference too between talking to the C-suite and what happens in regionally on the ground. Um, also, just the data sharing. And also looking at volume, referrals and volume, and um, and also looking too at how the um, making sure that those referrals and volumes come in quickly enough, so that if the community-based organizations are setting up a stronger and more robust infrastructure to be able to deliver on the contracts, that they can offset their costs. So those are just a few of the things. And Lucy, I'm sure you have more. Yeah, I would jump in a little bit. Thanks, Sandy. That's great. And I would echo some of what Sandy said. And certainly Meals on Wheels programs, much like AAAs and other CBOs, um, are extremely interested in partnering with healthcare. And they've been doing that. Um, um, they have been doing that for, for years, executing partnerships on the ground. We too have been investing in education. We have healthcare resource centers. We've had learning collaboratives. We've done a lot of those kinds of things. But in our conversations with MA plans, we've tried to listen really hard as to what it is they need that will make it easier for them to want to partner. And one of the things we've heard is that um, yes, consistency is an issue. They want to know, you know, how how are we going to guarantee that what's available to members in one community is going to be similar to, or you know, to and consistent to what's available in another community. They also don't know how to, nor do they necessarily want to, engage with hundreds of local providers mm -hmm. organizations. So um, what we've done at Meals on Wheels America is we've set ourselves up and we've made the investment to become the one-stop shop for the Medicare Advantage plans. So they can contract with us, we'll engage all of the local programs, we'll ensure that everything's consistent, we'll ensure they're fully compliant, we will work with the MA plan on data sharing agreements, we have a HIPAA compliant tech platform, we handle all the referrals through that, we handle all billing and reporting, so we've tried to listen hard to what's important to them in terms of their operations and set ourselves up to be able to work with that. So we're, we're sort of working on a two-pronged strategy. We continue to support local programs who want to contract directly, maybe with a hospital system or an MA plan um, that's very local. Um, and then we have a national strategy um, where we um, can contract on their behalf and then engage them in, in the process. That seems to be, you know, getting traction, um, I think, with Medicare Advantage plans because it's addressing some of their primary concerns. And Narita, let's think. Just, yeah. you know, I think that, that, that we, what we're speaking to about both Lucy and Sandy, this coordination of services so that the patient is connected, you know, mm -hmm. all of the social determinants, including health, including education, including uh, neighborhood and community are all part of what the person needs in order to be able to have a fulfill. And especially if somebody is isolated because of either language or hearing problems, having that link with the community and the multi-generational participation of people who, who are, you know, sometimes of the same ethnic groups or practice in the same religious institutions, bringing community together is key. And many of these certain community-based organizations that are, you know, accepted by the person 
function much better than somebody who comes into the community and sets up shop and doesn't really know exactly. You know, that's why the Meals on Wheels is so important because they're getting food. So that's a basic need. And then with that, you can get, oh no. Oh, you still. I think I lost myself. We still have you though, Narita, you're good. Okay, <laughs> okay. But well, anyway, that's what I wanted to say. Let me see if I can find myself again. <laughs> I, I, I want to switch gears and talk about technology, but before I do that, Brandon, did you want to, was there anything that you wanted to add specifically about some of the nuances of working with Medicare Advantage plans? Where are there opportunities for improvement? How, like what's going well and what isn't going well? I think over the last, I know for over the last five years, uh, Medicare Advantage and in, in when it comes to hearing and hearing aid coverage has, has uh, went up uh, exponentially. And I've, you know, listened to everyone talk about the community-based and and uh, hearing uh, healthcare, you know, is is community based. Um, mm -hmm. You can't just send something out and, as I said earlier, just pop it in your ear. You have to, you know, we don't we don't sell uh, Starkey. We don't provide products directly um, to the end user. We work through uh, hearing healthcare providers, and then we have a network throughout the United States um, that has been built over forty years. And then being able to leverage that network for community based uh, healthcare. And right now, you know, you you know. We uh, also work with around 27 uh, states. There's 27 state programs for Medicaid type um, uh, support and hearing healthcare for those that uh, can't afford it uh, as well. So we have a strong network that makes sure that the, the patient uh, is taken care of because that's the key differentiator in our industry is it's, it's not as much as the device, but the professional fitting and comfort because people think, well, I could wear an AirPod uh, all day, and I know this will might transition to your technology part, um, but you can't. You wear an AirPod for maybe an hour. You know, we design and manufacture uh, and build products that are designed to to be worn for 14 hours a day, and you have to forget you're wearing it. So it is a really good transition to talking about technology. It is um, it is advancing rapidly. I think the last few months have probably accelerated that even more so than mm -hmm. we otherwise would have seen. And it's, it's really hard to tease apart social service sort of interventions from technology. So I guess, Brandon, staying with you, um, if you could talk a little bit more to how technology is changing in a way that's allowing the healthcare community to address Medicare beneficiaries more holistically, but, but also are there unique considerations tied to technology deployment as we think about individuals who you know, they might be socioeconomically disadvantaged, they might have specific disabilities, they might be among particular age groups. Yeah, and, and for us, um, you know, the, the journey, what we, the, the patient journey in the hearing healthcare industry is about seven years. So it takes about seven years from the time I think I have a hearing loss to I want to do something about it. Uh, as I uh, kind of joke, you know, we're in the business of, of providing uh, products and services that really nobody wants, because when you think of a hearing aid, what do you think of? Um, again, it goes back to that, that stigma, but at Starkey, you know, there's five hearing aid manufacturers in the world. We're the only U.S. owned and, and operated. All of our R&D is out of uh, here in Minneapolis. And uh, over the last three years, we've been taking a different approach. Well, you started five years ago, uh, but a different approach of reinventing the hearing aid because you have to have a hearing aid. You talk about technology, good sound quality. People want to be, uh, they want to hear uh, in noise restaurants, uh, family gatherings, uh, places of worship, whatever it might be, but also expanding the dimensions of hearing aids into a overall, uh, what we call healthable technology. Because if you think of the ear, you know, it's a gateway to uh, health and wellness. And we're using it uh, for activity uh, monitoring. Uh, um, so think of your Fitbit, uh, but we're putting sensors in the hearing aid, not in the phone, but actually in the hearing aid uh, that is monitoring uh, someone's uh, uh, social uh, uh, activity and engagement and uh, making sure that they're staying engaged, they're wearing their hearing aids, they can monitor themselves, or we also have technology that allows the caregiver uh, to monitor their mother or grandmother that uh, uh, might be uh, uh, a distant place and, and making sure that they're staying engaged. So we have uh, really expanded what a hearing aid is because it goes beyond sound quality and really think that, you know, we look at it in three buckets. It's gotta be the best hearing aid, which is your, your sound quality, your healthable technologies, because think about uh, what we could do with blood pressure, temperature, um, and others from um, uh, sensors in the air. 
uh, and that we're working on and expanding that dimension. And then the third uh, component of our, our technology approach is personal assistant. So right now our hearing aid will tell somebody or remind a patient uh, medication, time to take your medication. So if you see somebody uh, talking out loud, they might be talking to their hearing aid because their hearing aid's talking to them. So or their, really, or their iPhone. <laughs> or their yeah. iPhone, exactly, yes. <laughs> and I mean, we're streaming with everything, so it's all about connectivity now. Yeah, I just wanted to add, you know, with this COVID epidemic, pandemic, the need for technology has become incredible. Uh, we're doing televisits, which means that many of our seniors have had to learn how to use technology in a different way just to stay safe because they can't sometimes go to visits, they're afraid to go to visits. So in order to have that continuity of care and the ability to keep people well, um, we have to figure out ways and education of course is a social determinant. So how to get our seniors working uh, on learning uh, the latest technology and being involved with with uh, telehealth in a way that is 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 beneficial for them. The other thing is, you know, language comes into play here. You know, we in the National Hispanic Medical Association are trying to get more and more Hispanic physicians involved, making sure that our physicians are involved not only in the inpatient or outpatient, but also in the community and going out to do educational seminars and things. Uh, and one of the things that I like about what's happening with Medicare is that it's becoming more and more involved in preventative health as opposed to the treatment of chronic problems. So I think that those are all good things and fit right into the social determinants of health model. Yeah, and Allison, if I could just jump in, and that's, uh, I think that what we're seeing in technology, as you said, is a huge boom in technology and technology options. And, and I completely agree. I think the past seven months have escalated and amplified the whole telehealth um, opportunity. And, and that's not going away. And, and there are really good things about telehealth, as you pointed out. Um, but I think what we found from the community-based organizations perspective is we've created linkages now on the healthcare front to almost be navigators um, for older adults and mm -hmm. caregivers around the use of telehealth because recognizing that for many, they don't have the equipment or if they have are given the equipment, they may not know how to use it. So um, making sure, I think there's really a whole new realm here where community-based organizations can enter in and support the telehealth um, expansion. But beyond telehealth, I think what we're also seeing, and, and certainly during COVID, is using technology to be able to do health and wellness checks, also, certainly, you know, the whole issue of social isolation and loneliness has come to the forefront during COVID, and it will be with us post-COVID, is utilizing technology to do assessments um, and to make that part of care planning with area agencies on aging and other community-based organizations looking at, you know, playing that role. Um, but the one thing I would say, and you pointed it out, was there are also some challenges here. One is having the equipment, the other is training on the equipment, and there's also socioeconomic disparities in, in the availability of that, plus whether you have internet, whether you have broadband at all. These are all uh, challenges that we have, and when we think of technology, we then tend to think of it as um, you know, smartphones and really smart devices, but for rural America, um, technology is still the phone. And so we also need to, as we're looking at technology, is to make sure that we don't leave people out of opportunities to connect. And especially in hard to reach areas, and that really crosses not only a rural divide, but a, a socioeconomic divide as well. Yeah, and that's also true when people don't have access to internet so that Medicare has to recognize that sometimes visits have to be done on the phone without people looking at each other. And so far they haven't really accepted that as a method that can be reimbursed and, and used to provide healthcare. Lucy. I was just gonna say, you know, it's interesting, um, obviously on the ground, meal, Meals on Wheels programs have been on the ground every day coping with um, all of, of this and, um, 
I think technology is a solution that um, lots of players are looking to. And I think um, new and different players are flocking <laughs> into this space because they see an opportunity. And quite frankly, it's not just nonprofits, it's for profits who, who see an opportunity, right? And I think at the end of the day, um, we have to not think that there's a single solution to any of this, right? That um, it's going to be multi-sector, it's gonna to have to be multimodal, if you will. I mean, and technology will help with some issues for some people, and it will not help with other issues for other people. And I think we have to, I think as a society, really look at this more holistically, these issues and challenges and look at who we're trying to serve um, rather than trying to you know, pick up the next new shiny. Um, I cannot tell you how many emails I get every day from new venture type folks who have identified the best new app that's gonna solve for everything for seniors. <laughs> and if only they could get into the homes of those vulnerable seniors, so who do they call? Meals on Wheels, right? Because we're the ones who are going to, to the homes. So I just think we need to just step back and think holistically and understand that there's a portfolio of interventions and solutions that are gonna be needed to solve for these. And that's where I think Medicare Advantage, you know, and, and some of these plans have already embraced these social determinants as core to their strategy. And that's very exciting to see um, that they're looking at it more broadly. And I think there's real opportunity for some Medicare Advantage plans to um, stake out a real thought leadership role here in, in working with CBOs and others to sort of form a strategic path forward to solve for this societal challenge, if you will. And I think that's exciting. Yeah, and yeah, just if I could just interject really quickly, because I really want to build on the point that Lucy made. Technology is wonderful, but for older adults and for caregivers, that personal touch and that personal engagement is still important. It's certainly challenging during COVID, but we're still seeing, you know, that need for personal touch. So I think as we look forward, it's how are we going to blend the best of technology with the important human touch um, that community-based organizations, area agencies, Meals on Wheels programs are invited into the home and their eyes in the home. And how do we blend these two together? Because the demand is only going to increase. So we need to, to be, make sure we're using the best of both strategies. And I think I want to add to that, that involving the home care attendants and the people who are helping the elderly at home is very important, as well as family, you know, because there are family that can actually be helpful in, in helping the uh, person negotiate some of what's going on. But I agree with you, the personal touch I think is key because uh, I, we're, we're, our, genera our generation, I, I consider myself elder, my gener our generation is, is not as techy as let's say the 25 year olds that are coming through now, you know. Well, so, I, I, think I, that, I think hearing health care starts with caring no matter what you're in and everybody's mm -hmm. absolutely in alignment as we talk about caring and you know, I've heard of the COVID and the, uh, the isolation. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in our industry and for what we see, people are uh, disconnected, they're isolated. And especially now with, you know, whether it's stay at home or uh, self quarantine, I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, more and more relevant where it's look, you're looking at depression and everything that leads from it. Mm -hmm. And embracing technology, what we've been able to do as well from a hearing standpoint, um, you know, is fault, you know, our hearing aids, the hearing aids now, uh, we've come up with uh, the sensors in the ears, uh, hearing aids for fall detection and alert. So even though somebody can't be, a caregiver can't be with their loved one, if there is a fall in the household, uh, the hearing aid, uh, and speaking of technology, will alert uh, the caregiver. Uh, also, we've been able, we've had to adapt and move uh, for mask, uh, for everyone wearing masks, even if you have normal hearing, it's hard to understand or you know you lose the visual cues and we've adapted to uh, new technology, what we call mask mode uh, in hearing aids, where the hearing aid adapts to being able to focus uh, using AI on that person in front of you so you can hear clean, cleaner and better. Uh, because again, you, you know, I think we take for granted how, many, uh, how much we all use uh, the visual and facial cues of reading people's lips. So we have to embrace the technology. We have to make it simple. We know that convenience and and uh, control is what uh, the patients want. And, and uh, I think we're all in the same uh, mindset of 
it is that human touch. It starts with the caring and then everything else leads from there. Let me ask a follow-up question to this. I'm curious, a few of you kind of kind of started to go down this path, but in addition to challenges with access for technology or understanding how to use it, Brandon, you started to talk a little bit about this. How do you get beyond um, just willingness to or not to use something. I mean, Brandon, you touched on this with the stigma associated with a hearing aid, for example. And I think there's also this perception with technology in the home, you're seeing into my home, which can be really powerful from a provider's perspective and a plant's perspective, but it can feel really invasive from a beneficiary's perspective. So um, would anyone like to talk a little bit about how you've been able to move past that I think, I think the invasion of the home uh, and the, the feeling that people have, not only, you know, students, everybody is going through this where they're having Zoom meetings from home. I think that you have to get buy-in and one of the buy-ins has to come from community organizations and, play, you know, in places that are trusted uh, because you don't really allow anybody into your home even on a video unless you really trust that they're, they're not. The other thing we have to talk about is housing insecurity. You know, people are living in places that they may not want somebody to see that their background or see where they are. And sometimes they need some help with, hey, if you don't want your background on, you know, there are these, you know, you can put a beach background or something like that. So teaching, and, but the most important thing I think is gaining trust. Uh, because once you have that one-to-one -one and people trust you, then they will learn from you. And that's, I think, what's the beauty of having, you know, the people who do have home care providers, because they already trust them with everything. Mm -hmm. so the next step would be to have that person learn and introduce uh, the person to some of the things that are available. The other thing, it opens up to friendships. You know, you can have a a tea meeting or a friendship meeting with you, with people in your community, you know, that has no goal. You just want to talk to people. So I think that that isolation is real and we have to figure out a way that we can overcome that. And again, I'm just glad we are addressing these social determinants that are so pervasive uh, and need to be addressed. Great. So let, let me give a heads up to the audience that we're going to do one more question and then open it up to you all. So start thinking about your questions and get ready to enter them into um, the, the discussion uh, channel. Um, so my, my last question is really broad, but what policy opportunities do you all see to address all of this, right? To, to better address socioeconomic need to better address social determinants of health in the Medicare population. I mean, we're, we're kind of inching forward, but what do you think is needed? And Lucy, do you want to go ahead and start? Yeah, um, thanks, Allison. Um, that's a great question. So I think there's actually a, a short-term answer and a long-term answer um, that I would uh, tee up for that. Um, in the short term and with COVID, you know, community-based organizations are just overwhelmed right now. And in, in the near term, it's all about funding, right? Getting more resources to local programs um, so that they can um, continue to step up and, and meet the challenge. And they are the true heroes in all of this, really. These, these folks who are on the ground doing everything they can to continue to deliver service to, to folks. So federal funding, state funding. I mean, our ideal, of course, we'd like to see things like nutrition services become standard covered benefits under Medicare, all Medicare and Medicaid plans, right? That would be our ideal. Um, so in the, in the short term, you know, we know that those are good investments. We know we'll help keep people out of high cost acute care and long-term care settings. Um, but thinking a little bit bigger, I think one of the things that's unique about community-based services is that they're not commodities, right? They are human services. And that is something different and we need to think about them differently. And as a country, we have not really invested in the social service infrastructure that it takes to really provide that safety net for people at the community level to meet their most basic needs. We leave that to the nonprofits who get some federal funding, who then have to hold galas and whatnot to try to raise money. Um, and we know that they're still only touching a fraction of the people who could benefit from the services. So we're not really at all mining the potential 
of all of these local social service agencies because we don't invest in them in that way. And I would love to see, you know, just because they're using armies of volunteers doesn't mean they're free. It's very, you know, it is not free by any stretch of the imagination. And I would love to see in the longer term policymakers and decision makers really take that on. And so that you truly, that they look at the social service infrastructure and the healthcare infrastructure and how both, how well are they both situated and how well are they integrated overall as a network instead of leaving it to all of these smaller efforts that will take so much longer. So. I just wanna add, Medicare is an amazing legislation and we really, really need to protect it. Um, with the way things are, sometimes when things get revised, they get destroyed. And I think the fact that we have Medicare for a population that is very needy of these services, it's really, really important. But, you know, as Lucy said, I think we need to broaden what the coverage is and what is considered to be basic care. But I just, uh, you know, just worry because in our political environment, it's easy for a replacing legislation to be, to threaten a previous legislation. So we really, really need to be protective of these services that are available to the elderly uh, and to, you know, to the population over 65, which is not considered elderly anymore. But I, I, I just, just as a word of caution that anything that we tinker with, we could ruin. That's all. Yeah. Well, and I would just add, add in really quickly, I think at the beginning of our conversation, we noted the fact that um, the supplemental benefits um, expanded the opportunities for funding, but didn't, there wasn't more money that was going into the pot to, so that you're, you know, MA plans are making the choice between vision and hearing, you know, um, some of the more typical uh, services that they'd offered before, and now the social determinants of health. They're both important. And, and we know that. And so we need to look at ways to be able to infuse the money to be able to fund both. And to Lucy's point, um, oftentimes on the social determinants of health, what ends up happening is healthcare plans turn to the, those nonprofit agencies, whether it be area agencies on aging or meal, uh, Meals on Wheels programs and expect us to do it out of our existing pots of money. And we can't. Um, during the COVID crisis, Area Agencies on Aging had a 93% increase in new clients. And of the existing clients, 70% had more extensive and complex needs. Those people aren't going away. Those needs are gonna be there post COVID and we need to find ways to be able to respond to them. So Sandy, you actually just touched on the very first audience question that came through, which, which is, what would it take to expand the capital that is being kind of allocated to supplemental benefits? So to your point, you don't have to do this sort of replacement or shifting around. Is that an insurmountable challenge given the political environment and the, sort of the culture around social services in its bucket and healthcare services in its bucket? Um, let me just open that up and see if, who wants to take that one. Is, is, it, is it a reality that we should expect that we could expect um, and expanded, uh, you know, supplemental benefit opportunity. So it's not replacement. So uh, just sharing my experience with the WIC program or the, the program that I was involved in the committee, one of the things we had was we had excess amount of money in one bucket and not enough to, to provide the services and the food for the children and women. And we did a lot of activism to try to get that money shift it. But, you know, as you know, with legislation, they legislate and things start being written in stone. So one of the things that we can do, especially through our Congress people, is activate, you know, for that kind of redistribution. If there is a place where there is money, but that money is not being utilized or is not needed, then how can we shift it? In our case, it was the administrative money and we had no money to provide services. So we would keep running out of money. And they did manage to get a redistribution of a percentage of that money to go back into the services uh, thing. Mm -hmm. So there are ways to be an activist and to try to fix it. And I think we all have to be interactive about where the needs of our community and how can we fix it so that they are able to get 
those services? Allison, I, I would, you know, A is, I don't think anything's insurmountable if there's will, right? You know, if people, but having said that, um, I think until we really look at this holistically, right? Um, because we know that in, in, you know, it's not necessarily always additive. I mean, I think, yes, there is a need for infusion of funds, certainly for the near term. But we also know that if we make investments in social services to address social determinants of health, we're gonna save money on the healthcare side. We don't know exactly what all that looks like if we thought about it holistically. Um, but I also do, you know, so I do think that there's opportunity there, but I do think it will take a, a shift in mindset quite frankly, from policies and decision makers and, you know, dare I say it, less polarization and more, you know, problem solving solution orientation um, in order to solve for this problem for the longer term. Um, and it will require more cross um, fertilization across government agencies so that social problems aren't the housing department, the health and human service department, the, you know, the education department the labor department and that we're looking at things in a more integrated fashion. And my guess is there's more resources within those that could be tapped, but then there would have to be also a willingness, I think, to shift some of the balance and then it becomes a, a national discussion on priorities, right? And how to invest taxpayer resources. Brandon or Sandy, either of you want to? Well, yeah. Um, the only other thing that I would add into it, and again, I, I, I support what the comments of the previous speakers, but I, I think, you know, the other thing in looking at the environment we're in now, where healthcare is really moving to value based payments, uh, you know, the community based organizations are moving there too. You know, again, in the survey that I noted, you know, almost 20% of, of area agencies on aging were engaged in at least one contract that had a value-based component, whether it was meeting specific targets to receive uh, withholding of payment or outcome measures, such as ER, reduction of ER services, hospital readmissions or engagement rates. So, you know, part of it is looking that broadly, and I, I completely support what Lucy said in looking across agencies instead of siloing everything. I think that's led to it. But I think the other thing is looking, I, I, community-based organizations are willing to play mm -hmm. in the value-based arena. And um, and we really need to do more exploration there. Yeah, and I I mean we need to you know look up and out. Um, you know I, I don't think I'm going to say anything new that anybody hasn't already stated uh, and prioritize. You know what is what is needed uh, across the agencies and what are the hearing um, uh, from a hearing standpoint. You know for us it's about also education on why hearing loss is important and then getting physicians just to do a normal hearing uh, test. Uh, for anybody over X age uh, for uh, when they go in for their physical. Because we talk, if you look at the, uh, our, the, uh, the Veterans Administration is our largest customer and one of the largest buyers of, of hearing aids in the United States. And uh, the number one uh, and two condition of our veterans is tinnitus, the ringing of the ears, and then hearing loss. And it is a, uh, you know, go outside the VA, it is a silent health issue. And again, for us, you talk about policy, we talk about working across uh, barriers, you know, better hearing is about connecting people with people. And uh, for us, it's about the education and making sure people understand, you know, and eliminating that stereotype uh, for what needs to be done uh, to help with, you know, what I like to say, hearing gain. Let's don't talk about hearing loss. Let's talk about hearing gain. Let's talk about better hearing. Let's talk about overall health and wellness uh, because, you know, fixing somebody's hearing leads to a lot of other um, uh, benefits um, and getting them reconnected. I just wanted to suggest that one of the things that's going to be coming up is the need for more funding for technology and that we could possibly, you know, hook into writing that technology van and get funding for technology education for, for seniors and get involved with getting them access to uh, internet and to other things that they may not even know they want, but that may be useful to them in the future. So they, it's going to be from K all the way through, and we might as well just add in or make sure that our representatives add in our population. And, uh, you know, I'll quickly comment, I'll stay in my lane here in the hearing health. 
you know, there's a lot of articles in the social media on uh, telehealth and what, what we can do to help uh, patients with, you know, programming their hearing aids or helping them with hearing, uh, hearing care during this COVID time. And I think that's, you know, those make for good articles. But then as you were saying, I think there's the reality, right? It's the technology of, uh, are they gonna be able to do it from the in-home care? So I think there's a natural evolution that's going to happen where, you know, we always talk about patient, there was patient-centered care. Now it's patient-driven care. And we got to think about ease of use uh, and convenience. And, you know, I could speak for, for my uh, uh, lovely uh, 92 uh, young uh, grandmother. Um, you know, she's not going to do a telehealth uh, on her iPad, even though I have her an iPad, unless it's very simple. And because uh, that frustration sets in and then, you know, forget everything. They don't want to do any of the telehealth for whatever the condition might be. Yeah. So I think there's a natural evolution. This is going to evolve, but it makes for good discussion and, and articles and, and uh, studies. Well, and Allison, just, you know, when we're talking policy, just to note that there are several pieces of legislation to expand and enhance telehealth that are already have been introduced and also around social isolation. And just as was mentioned is to be able to provide the technology, the training and assistance um, to older adults to be able to ensure that they can stay engaged. So there are policy initiatives that are out there. Uh, we just gotta get them over the finish line. Well, and this is a perfect segue. We've got time for one last question very quickly because we've got four minutes here, but one more that came in from the audience, which is what do you think the lasting impacts from COVID will be regarding how healthcare and non-medical services are delivered? And some of it's going to be the policy environment that you guys are touching on. Some of it's going to be what people accept as kind of the normal course of receiving care moving forward. But um, what's the new world order when COVID is done? Innovation. I mean, it's going to be, uh, I think uh, a lot of us in whatever field it may be had to quickly uh, learn, adapt, uh, and what we needed to do for uh, a care of the patient. And, you know, the technologies I, I mentioned, whether it's uh, uh, remote programming, more in-home services, I mean, whatever it might be, um, it's really the technology is going to evolve around service. And it really starts with that caring and that service aspect. I think we have to gird ourselves for change. I think that the change that has happened is pretty permanent in many ways, and that we don't know how long we're going to be using masks and how long we're gonna to have to be doing social distancing. But however long that is, I think that we all as humans are gonna need help uh, in, in negotiating or being able to, to, to accept these changes that are coming. And some of us that are older, it's gonna be harder, but the change is here. Yeah, and I would just follow up by saying that, you know, what we're seeing from the area agency's perspective is a lot more outreach um, from healthcare to community-based organizations around social determinants of health. We hope that continues. And again, the issues of telehealth and social isolation are paramount and they're with us to stay. And I guess I would um, echo part of Sandy's, I think, yes, more interest in figuring out how to create these partnerships. But I also think um, how people's perceptions and behaviors are going to change is, you know, it's not at all clear to me that, you know, older adults are ever gonna go back to pre-COVID. And that's going to change. When we had a system that was already strained for trying to meet demand, now we have, it's, 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 you know, it was here, now it's here, maybe it's going to be here, right? And we're going to have this huge gap that we're going to have to figure out how to fill for the longer term would be my guess. And I think the way things get delivered is going to be markedly different than the way they were delivered before. So. Great. Thank you all for your very rich perspectives. Um, there already was a movement in this direction toward technology and addressing social determinants of health. And if there's any good that comes out of this pandemic, it is hopefully that it escalates mm -hmm. um, our commitment in both of those spaces. So thank you guys. Um, and I think that is a wrap for our panel. So uh, any, any other questions that come in from the audience, I think that you can submit those to the platform and um, these recordings will be available for 60 days. So thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.